All right, so as I said before, um, we're not going to do chapter 22, which is on uh, shaping the earth, uh, just because it, it, you know, it's a, it's a bit tedious, I think, and it's all about how rivers and how the water table works and all that good stuff, but I just, I, I just figured we'd spend a little more time, and because we're starting a little late anyway, on uh, chapter 23, which is uh, reading the rock record. Now, you think, oh no, more rocks. It's actually not too bad. This really is the history of the world, which is, anybody remember how old the Earth is, roughly? Millions of years, a couple hundred years. 4.5 billion years, okay? Give or take, right? Um, remember, I, I think I already told you my, my favorite joke. I did tell you my favorite joke. Um, about the guy, two guys who walk into the, uh, they walk into the Natural History Museum, and one turns to the other and says, uh, "That see that dinosaur over there? That dinosaur is a million and four years old." And the other guy says, "How do you know it's a million and four years old?" And he says, "Well, I came here four years ago, and they told me it was a million years old." Well, it's the same. It's the same idea with the 4.5 billion years. That could be off by 0.1 billion years, or whatever, I mean, hundreds of millions of years off. But it's a it's a pretty rough estimate. But it's. Uh, uh, as good as we can get right now. So um, the story of the, the world being 4.5 billion years long, we really can't go day by day, right? We got we to gotta kind of talk about broad amounts of time and lots and lots of time, um, more than you probably ever really thought of in the scope of like an hour um, or a couple hours. Being 4.5 billion years old, they, they give a really good analogy in the book about hey, look, let's compare the age of the world to one year. Let's just say it was one year. How long ago would these things be happening? Well, of course, the first day, January 1st, would have been the formation of the Earth. Well, we didn't have rocks yet until February 26th, like almost two months into that year. Like the Earth was just kind of solidifying and taking its time doing that, that right? Okay, so we're talking like already, we're already like almost two months into the year, and that's when we start getting rocks. Okay, we don't even get bacterial life, which was the, the most primitive form of life, until March, well, more or less the most primitive, until March 23rd, which is like almost three months in, right? Okay, now, okay, you say fine, fine, well, we're going a month at a time. You didn't have dinosaurs until mid December. Okay, that's like, what, seven months of just bacteria and like very primitive types of life forms, okay? And we're talking billions of years at this point, okay? That's a lot, that's a lot of space before we even had dinosaurs, which, by the way, were millions, which hundreds of millions of years ago, okay? Now, Homo sapiens, right, are pretty much our direct ancestors. Well, sorry, I guess it's really us. Yeah, Homo sapiens are our direct ancestors who were actually humans. Okay, didn't show up till December 31st, 10 minutes before midnight. Okay, that's how short an amount of time humans have actually been on Earth. Such a short amount of time. And the Earth, like, if we did, if we started, like, launching nuclear weapons and, like, destroyed, like, all humans on Earth, the Earth would be like, nah, whatever. <laughs> right, because it's 4.5 billion years between then and now, and it's just a long time. Human history, in other words, the stuff we know and have written down and have talked about and et cetera, basically one minute before midnight. Like that's the tiny, tiniest little fraction of the scope of the entire world is like what we can actually know from human existence that we've been able to, you know, record one minute out of that whole year. So you get the scale of some of these things about how long it takes between X happening and Y happening in the geologic portion of the Earth. So this is why we can't do the whole thing, obviously. And by the way, a whole lot of it is pretty much of the same sort of stuff. Now obviously, you know, continents are moving during that time and the Earth is gaining oxygen, or the atmosphere is gaining oxygen and losing oxygen and ice, uh, the, the polar ice caps are forming and so forth. Technically, right now, we're actually in an ice age, believe it or not. It doesn't seem like it, but the fact that we have poles that are frozen designates, partially, that we're actually in an ice age right now. So the Earth has cooled and warmed, and most of the Earth was a lot warmer than it is now. Even though we're we all talk about oh, global warming and blah, blah, blah. 
we, we, there, is, there is much evidence to say that humans have affected kind of the end of this ice age in some sense. But, uh, but as far as ice ages go, we're in one now and there have been lots of ups and downs over the years. Tom. That was what I was going to ask about was with the global warming or climate change or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we'll talk for a minute on, on man's effect on what's, and, and women's, man being the generic, general term, um, and on humans' effect on the, the, what's going to happen from now on. We have done a lot of, we have made a lot of changes in that last minute to the Earth's surface. I mean, you can just, just the fact that we can look at satellites and see the entire, you know, we can see the uh, clearing of vast amounts of space, uh, amounts of, of land, and, you know, they say when the first settlers came to the United States, and that's, you know, like 1159.50, right? I mean, we're not talking very long ago in this grand scheme. A squirrel could go, could actually go from the east coast of the United States to the west coast without touching the ground. In other words, jumping from tree to tree to tree to tree. That's how many trees there were in North America at that point. We have cleared like 90% of that, right? And, you know, for various reasons, obviously, mostly population increase and agriculture and all that. But we have done a lot of, we have made a lot of changes to the earth. I think in the grand, grand, grand scheme of things, the Earth will probably bounce back in some form or another, obviously, once humans are either have either left or have uh, died out. Yeah. OK, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, how do we know how old some of these things are, right? How do we know how old the, the various, or all these eras that we're going to talk about and all these times, how do we know this? Well, we go back to this. Well, first of all, we start with relative dating. Okay, relative dating is not something that you do in like West Virginia, right? Relative dating, no offense to anybody from West Virginia. No, West Virginia, no, West Virginia. Totally different. Um, what's that? I won't say Kentucky. I know some of you guys are definitely from Kentucky. Um, anyway, relative dating is saying, hey, if we know one time period because of some feature of the Earth, Given that we have rocks that are made in sedimentary layers and blah, 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 we can, in a relative sense, say, hey, this is older than this, and this is younger than this, and so forth. And it's all based on kind of relative ages, not definitive ones. There are ways of getting definitive ages for much of this um, to a certain extent. And if we can do that, it, um, it is uh, much better for the, you know, for the overall picture, but we can't always get these. Uh, relative ages, so we deal with the whoa. Uh oh, what have I done? I'm trying not trying not to blow this up, but my computer is there's no power right now, so over here. All right, we'll fix that in a bit. Okay. Um, the first thing we have is this uniformitarianism. Okay, what that means is that the Earth has changed in slow processes over long periods of time. Now. Humans, again, have, have changed that to some extent. The Earth, to a certain extent, has changed. Mainly just surface effects, though. We haven't yet pushed continents around, right? We have pushed lots of, we have pushed a fair amount of mass around in, term, in some sense. Like, for instance, you guys know that most of Boston, Massachusetts used to be underwater. It wasn't until humans came along and started filling in parts of the city that most of the city is now above water, right? So we've done some of that, okay? And we have, uh, We've affected that to, to a certain extent, but, but really the, the, you know, the Earth itself, outside of those surface effects, long time and slow processes that go. Yeah, Annie. How do they take into account like, catastrophic events? Like, good question. Those, the, the, the good question about how do, they take care, how do they take into account catastrophic events? Well, a lot of those catastrophic events are actually reflected in the record of the Earth. So we'll talk a little bit about when the dinosaurs uh, were made extinct, possibly by a giant like meteor or even an asteroid or comet or something like that. Um, you can see the result of that to this day in certain rock layers. So they can take care, they can take into account something like that. And it really has to be a big enough effect that is kind of that huge thing. We'll also talk about how the moon formed. They think uh, I've heard various interpretations of this, but the, at this point the the idea is that the moon formed by another giant, almost planet-like mass, maybe the size of Mars, hitting the Earth and like knocking a chunk off in, that became our moon. So I mean, that's catastrophic. I mean, you know, our moon is a quarter of the size of the Earth. It's like knocking a quarter of the Earth away in one, one fell swoop. That would be catastrophic. And, you can, and I don't know that you can see that in the rock record, but 
Um, we had the idea that that's what happened. Yeah? Is it one of the theories that uh, a large enough comet or meteor or something like that came into Earth's gravitational field and then formed the moon? There, there are, uh, there, yes, there are arguments that say that, that the Earth has captured some other uh, body in its, uh, in its orbit. Um, I think there are problems with that theory based on the fact that it's, it's difficult to have something ca the exact right orbit to get caught in the Earth's yeah. orbit, in the, the something especially as big as the moon. So really the Earth, we'll get to this when we talk about astronomy, the Earth and the moon are really considered a double planet. Like the Earth, is, the moon is big enough that you can really consider the Earth and the moon two planets if you want to, which is kind of kind of cool. Okay, all right. So the rock record, and one of the reasons we talked about all those types of rocks and so forth is to get to this stuff. The rock record has effects that come from these, uh, these either catastrophic events or just long forming events that you can see by digging into the rocks and like observing them and, and doing experiments on them. Okay? Of course, because they're talking about billions of years, pieces and parts are missing. So we can't exactly get everything perfect, but that's why geologists keep their jobs, because they keep looking and keep looking. And they look to these parts where there are uh, lots of differences, uh, or lots of missing pieces, and then they you know, dig a little bit, and then you get your PhD, because you figured out one little bit of it. So that's the way it goes, right? Talked about relative dating. Relative dating is looking at the ordering of rocks, or what's embedded in the rocks, or other rocks are involved. Okay, and then we talk, and then radiometric dating, which we talked about like four, cha five chapters ago, which is where you use some substance of the rock that uh, decays radioactively over time. You measure how much is there. You measure the, bypro the, the byproducts of the radioactivity, and then you make an assumption, uh, some assumptions, and you say, hey, because there's so much of this substance, like lead, left over from uranium uh, decay, we can say, ah, this piece, this rock is so old. Okay, we can also look at um, dating using carbon dating, but rocks are not carbon based, so you can't really do it with rocks. And you can only do that back to a certain amount. Uranium, very good because it's got a half life itself of like 4 billion years, so that's a good one. And most minerals have trace amounts of uranium in them, so it works out all right. Okay? All right. Sorry, I'm, this is why sitting there doesn't help because you've got to go. Good, good, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, Another one we can have, another way we do some of this uh, relative dating, original horizon horizontality. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Remember how we said that like sedimentary rocks, one layer is on the next, is on the next? If you look at a picture of the Grand Canyon, you can see all those different layers. Well, is the layer on the bottom younger or older than the one above it? It's older because the one above it was deposited on top. Not necessarily true if there's some earthquake that flips the rocks over, but that's when you use other types of um, ways to, to measure this, and, and you look at a lot. You don't just base it just on one. Okay, um, top layers are younger. Okay, there's also cross cutting, which we'll see a picture of in a bit, where you can get rock that goes through other pieces, whether it's from magma or from some other um, event that happens where the rock goes through. You can uh, use that to tell which layer is uh, there. If a rock cuts through other rocks, well, it has to be younger because it, ha it cut through those. Okay. All right. We've also got inclusion. I mentioned this a little bit. Any rock that's inside of another rock, for some reason, has to be what older than it, because the other rock form, somehow formed around it. Okay, so you have to do that. Um, there's also lateral continuity, which means if you've got a section way over here and a section over here, but they have all the same layers in them, it doesn't matter if they're separated by hundreds of miles or thousands of miles in some cases. You can use those two to figure out where those are. Good example, uh, the people that figured out that, that, uh, that Africa and South America were once kind of together looked at different uh, rock layers and said, hey, these piece up very well together. Okay, so that works. And there's also this faunal succession. Anybody know what fauna are? If I say something of fauna versus flora, fauna, animal life, for instance, or I guess plat life if you want. Yeah, fauna. It's like it means animal life. Fossils that were either plant or animal, I guess, um, follow one another in a definite time scale. So if you know what one fossil is older than another fossil, because you, can, you, you know that this one evolved from the other one or whatever, and you find them in two different rock areas, well, you know that one rock has to be older than the other based on that 
fossil record. So it's very cool stuff. Okay, all right. There are all these, these other things called unconformities. I didn't even think that was a word until I read this. Okay, unconformities are when you get rocks that are actually tilted because of earthquakes or things, or folded because of various events, and the younger rock actually kind of covers it up, so, um, or actually kind of forms next to it. You can get, where is it here? Here's an angular unconformity. It's a little tricky to see here. When the sediments were deposited and then you get mountain building or earthquakes or whatever, you get these folds in it. And then you stop the mountain building because you're done with the mountain building. The, the volcano and earthquake or volcano is kind of done. Um, you expose some more away. You get these little indentations. And then guess what? You end up, they end up going underwater. And, they, and anyway, the point is that you look at this and you say, aha, this little piece here really could only be there because of all of this other mountain building and so forth. And therefore, you end up, you can date it, relatively speaking, that way. Okay. All right, take a look at the next one here. It's a little check question. Three dikes, which are these areas that go through the other, uh, other rock. You've got a sedimentary layers here, and then you've got these rocks that have kind of been built through them, formed through them. Who's oldest in this piece? C. How do you know C's oldest? B overlaps, B overlaps it, right? Or went yeah. through it, really. Yeah. It's not really on top of it. It's kind of through it, and right? A and A is so which is so which one are we gonna go here? Which one's the oldest here? C. C is the oldest, then B then A? Yes. Let's see if that's right. C is the oldest, then B then A. Okay? Good kind of question for uh, like, you know, a final exam coming up in a couple weeks. <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. All right. The embed here's another check question. The embedded rocks, that's like these little pieces. Are they gonna be older or younger than the sedimentary layers that formed around there. Well, they have to be older, right? Because the other layers happened on top of them or kind of included them as they, as they went along. Okay, good. All right. Then we have um, this, again, we talked about this before, so I won't go into too much detail. Radiometric dating is when you can tell by the radioactive isotopes how old what's left when we grab the rock now and test it is. Okay? We use things like uranium, okay, potassium, some carbon-14. But carbon's a problem because it only has a half-life of 5,000 years. If you're trying to date something that's millions of years old, you're just not going to be able to have enough carbon-14 left over. Okay? But lead or uranium-238, which decays into lead-206, 4.5 billion years of half-life. So if you started back when the Earth was formed with some uranium, well, now there's, only ha there's half of it still there. So you can really use this in a pretty, pretty good way to uh, do it. Not as much uranium-238 as there is 235, I think. I think that's correct. Um, but 235, still 704 million years. So you're doing all right. Okay, another question. Radiometric dating can give the actual age of a rock within limits. Okay? An exception to the actual age. Now, we didn't, we didn't kind of go through this, but let's think about this. Some rocks okay, actually are created by heating. You remember which ones are created by heating? Well, igneous rocks are created by me melting. Okay, so if you know that if you know that an an igneous rock, which is created by melting, is uh, once it stops melting, you can date how old that rock is. Turns out that well, sedimentary is a problem because you've got lots of uh, lots of layers. Also turns out that metamorphic rocks are tough to date using radiometric because as you heat, it kind of reforms some of the, uh, or it may include some other um, types of uh, ca types of minerals that you might not know uh, the age of. So it kind of resets the clock. I think that's here. So it's the sedimentary and the metamorphic that are the ones that sometimes we can't get those actual age. In sedimentary, the age of indi individual members can be determined, but not the age of which the rock itself formed. Because you can tell maybe when each individual layer was kind of deposited, but maybe not the rock itself, because that rock was created somewhere else and then ended up, ended up uh, deposited. Okay? And then you've got this time clock kind of reset for the, um, for the sedimentary, or for the uh, metamorphic rocks. When they heat up, that reforms into some other pieces. Okay? 
All right, now this is my favorite graph on the next page. I'll blow this up a little bit. This is what this video that I'm going to show you is all about. It's geologic time. Okay? It's the time scale of all of Earth's history. And of course, being good uh, Earth scientists, we have classified all these different time ranges. Okay? And we, nor we first did this using relative dates because that was really all that we had. But then again, we, then when we went back and had the ability to do radiometric dating, we were able to fix some of these time periods a little bit. Okay? And we get these units. There are eons. There's actually a geologic term called an eon. It's kind of cool. Okay, and it's the big, big time scales here. Okay, there's really only been two eons since the um, beginning of the Earth. Okay, and then we go, each eon is broken into various eras. And then those eras are broken into periods and subperiods, and then epochs, okay, is finally the, the last little one. And these are measured in this, this scale here. Let me blow this up. Um, these are actually measured oops, in, let's see if we can get this here, there we go, uh, measured in MAs, which actually stand for mega annums, which are millions of years. Okay? So for instance, the quaternary period, which was part of the Cenozoic era in the Than what is it? The Thanerozoic Fan Fan era. I can't even pronounce that one. Okay, that was, uh, let's see, 1.8 million years after the beginning of the Earth. Okay, so that's that's how you read the scale, and it goes down and down and down. Now, let's see if I can get it down here. Uh, there we go. Nope, nope. I can't for some reason. Hang on, I'll have to undo this. Uh, oh, you know what? I might have this on a different scale here. Let's see. There it is. Okay. Um, oh, not on the screen you're looking at. There we go. All right. Let's see if we can blow this up. This. What page is this on? I forget. Um, oh, sorry. What was that? Oh, the coffee. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, the coffee cup out here. Uh, okay. So let's see. So we do this, and if we go up, so some of these you've certainly heard about, right? The Jurassic period, right? There's a park named after it. Okay, the Jurassic, there's a park named after it, right? And in fact, I don't think, I don't think um, most dinosaurs were actually during the Jurassic, believe it or not, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Either. There's a Triassic period. Oh, by the way, I, I sorry, I've kind of got this, um, I've got this backwards. The quaternary period we are actually in right now 1.8 million years ago, not after the beginning of the Earth. I'm reading it upside down. Okay, started down at the bottom here. Okay, with Precambrian time. Now, one thing to notice about this, you'd think that Precambrian was much less time than Phanerozoic, which is what we're in now. But if you look at the time here, this is 2,500 million years ago, or 2.5 billion years ago. The next little step is 3.8 billion years ago, and then finally 4.5 billion years ago. Those are huge, huge jumps. This is not to scale. This is just showing you that we don't know that much about Precambrian time, but it was, what, let's see, um, 25, 2,500 to 4,500, two, it's about 2.5 billion years from here to here, right? That's a long, long time, <laughs> even though that's not, and remember, the whole thing is only 4.5 billion years. So we're doing that. Okay, so you've got a lot of these errors. We'll talk about mo many of these kind of in some detail. And again, the video uh, will go through boom, 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 each one. They might not talk about every one, but they'll we'll go through a bunch of them. Okay, all right. Okay, so geologic time. Okay, Precambrian time. This is the first one. Way back when the Earth started, that starts the Precambrian. Okay, Precambrian. Okay, is really before before the uh, visible types of life. There was some life that started during this time period. Okay, but most of it was bacteria that you can't see. Um, there were some soft-bodied organisms, but really, I mean, we're talking very, very small kinds of stuff. Primitive atmosphere and ocean, and the beginnings of the actual plates that were formed in the Earth. Because remember, when the Earth formed, it was molten. Right? It hadn't cooled down yet, so we got these, um, we got these uh, continents and things, and actual rocks yet. Okay, When we go through this, and this, again, this is why I think the video will be cool, uh, 
it's hard to believe the Earth looked like some of the things that we're talking about here. It's, um, it's amazing to think that what we're living on now wasn't like it is now in some sense. It was very, 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 very different. Okay, very different. Precambrian time. Okay, there are some fossils from this time. Okay, um, and algae and stuff. So I guess you can you could see some of this, but um, there are these things called stromatolites, which are the oldest fossils on the planet. Okay, a lot of them were caused by algae. Okay, bacteria and algae. There are these things called cyanobacteria. Right, cyanobacteria are uh, I, forget, I think they're just types of bacteria that I want to say they lived on maybe nitrogen and carbon sort of. Um, I'm not 100% sure though. We definitely did, okay, so we did have some plant fossils in the middle of the Precambrian era. And then there were some primitive, primitive animals. Most of the first animals that you'll think about in the ocean. Okay, they were not land-based animals at this point. And then we did have some multi-celled organisms. In other words, if you took a biology class, organisms that are multi-celled, more than one cell, and start to gain in size. Okay, before very small. Not quite. No, we're not quite to that in the Precambrian era, as far as I know. We, okay, but we'll we'll get to where where those sorts of um, those sorts of uh, animals came from, or when they were around. Okay, because the Earth started out as molten rock formed from a star, actually we should take a break. After this we'll take a break. I forgot you guys were here 20 minutes, 30 minutes before me. Um, the first atmosphere, mostly helium and hydrogen, there, were, there was nothing breathing that at this point, right? The second atmosphere, we had volcanoes outgassing, producing lots of carbon dioxide, Lots of water, actually. Okay, water vapor. The water vapor formed into the oceans, okay? And the carbon dioxide stayed in the atmosphere. The Earth did not have an oxygen atmosphere for billions of years. Like, there just was no oxygen there, okay? Eventually, though, we started removing the oxygen, or sorry, removing the carbon dioxide and, and putting oxygen into the atmosphere primarily because of what? What was, what was happening in that time period? Uh, plants. plants, which do what? Photosynthesize. They photosynthesize. The act of photosynthesis, we kind of briefly oxygen. touched on it. it. Right, it produces oxygen, it takes the carbon dioxide, right, turns it into sugar and so forth, and releases carbon dioxide, or sorry, releases oxygen as a byproduct. The first place that it released it was actually not into the atmosphere, it was into the ocean. Okay? And in the ocean, that uh, the oxygen ended up um, going into solution and oxidizing a lot of the iron that was actually in the oceans. And then um, once it did that, the, the iron oxides fell to the bottom of the ocean and it continued to do that. So there still wasn't much oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, until later, there were actually, there was enough photosynthesis and most of the iron oxides were gone from the oceans, so the oxygen was able to kind of go into the atmosphere, displace some of that carbon dioxide, and then you started getting other sorts of things. The other big one, if we're producing oxygen, and we're producing, remember what O3 was? Ozone. ozone, right? If we're producing ozone, that can go into the upper atmosphere, and that protects us from a lot of cosmic rays. Remember, the ozone actually absorbs a lot of the cosmic radiation and the, all the UV rays that, that are harmful to the increase in life, and you end up um, gaining uh, the ability to kind of have better evolution because of it. Yeah? So the, the formation of the ozone helped with the, with the plants grow, basically? The formation of the ozone helped with the plants and the animals growth, okay. yes. Yeah. OK. All right, tell you what, let's take a break. And we'll come back in about 10, and then we'll continue here. Here we go. All right, here's a question for you. The development of free oxygen was crucial to the emergence of life on Earth because it led to the formation of what? Air for animals. Mm. Ozone, which helped screen the Earth from harmful, harmful UV radiation. Ozone, which primitive organisms could breathe. Or D, the oceans where life emerged. All of the above. All of the above. Well, let's see. Did 
free oxygen. Uh, it did end up kind of in the ocean, that's true. Um, but life emerged there that wasn't necessarily ocean breathing, or sorry, oxygen breathing at first. Um, could, could organisms breathe O3? We never talked about it, but they can't. No, okay. not that I know of anyway. Did we talk about incoming UV? Yeah, yeah so it's probably that. And then air for animals to breathe. Well, yes and no. The, the initial development of free oxygen wasn't really for the animals. It more helped out because of the ozone. Yeah, the ozone actually. The ozone has screened us. Okay. Although I would, I would probably have accepted air as well for animals to breathe because eventually that's what happened. Okay. All right. Uh, we didn't talk much about this. Cyanobacteria. They helped oxygen to escape from the atmosphere. Well, did they keep carbon? Well, cyanobacteria use carbon to produce their cells and so forth, so yes. Uh, photosynthesis, cyanobacteria did photosynthesize. And did they release the oxygen from the CO2? They did, okay, so all the above. Yep, all the above. All right, good. Okay, all right, so we finished the Precambrian era or the Precambrian, um, I think we did. Wait, let's go back. Did we get to the, the Precambrian? Oh, there it is. Precambrian. Yep, the Paleozoic era is the first era in this Phanerozoic era. I, I still can't pronounce that. Paleozoic era. I, I don't know. Uh, it might be, yeah. All right. The Paleozoic era. OK, this is 300 million years. It's a long time not as long as the billions of years in the previous uh, pre-Cambrian era. Okay, but these are some of the ones you might have heard about. The Cambrian uh, period, the Ordovician era, or period, etc. I'm not even going to read the rest of them. Devonian, Carboniferous, okay. Um, the periods in this case are designated by changes of the types of life that you're seeing on Earth at this point of time, okay. Um, we get fossils from this period of time, lots of fossils from this period of time. Well, not lots, but enough that we can start looking at some of the uh, types of animals and plants that existed back in that time. Okay? So each period changed life, changed the plate tectonics. There was a lot of movement of the plates around here in this time period. We also got the sea level rising and falling. Okay? The sea level rises and falls for a, num a number of different reasons. But when the poles are ice forming, the, well, for, when ice forms in the poles, you get a lowering of the sea. When the ice melts, you get a rising of the sea. And that's actually what could be happening now. Um, the Seychelles, which is right next door and part of the Horn of Africa area of responsibility, um, they say that if the poles start melting more, the Seychelles will be underwater and gone. So not so great if you want to live there. No. Uh, I mean, like James. Topic, but, uh, yeah. What's the reason for low tides and high tides? Tides are a completely different issue. Tides are formed by the moon and the sun to some extent and the gravitational pull from the moon. Um, and we'll get into that when we talk about astronomy, actually. But it's, it's when the, the moon's gravitation kind of squeezes the water on both, pa both parts of the Earth. So that's where you get the rise and fall tides, yeah. Okay. All right, good. OK. The Paleozoic era was in the Cambrian period four, 543 million years ago. Okay. The Cambrian explosion, we got lots and lots of different forms of life. In fact, I, 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 made, I think there was more types of life back then than there is now, actually. Okay. Lots of different types of life, lots of it went extinct. We got these hard-bodied organisms, okay, not from lifting, like actual like, like shells and, and things like that. Um, organisms that secreted calcium, okay, calcium carbonate, which is the, you know, what forms your bones and forms that hard uh, material, is what formed these outer skeletons of much of these things. In your book, they show a bunch of pictures of, various pictures of like outer, there's one right here, may I? This is not one from our, the period we're talking about. Um, no, this is the next period, but it's like outer shell, like on the organisms, okay? Yeah. All right. So that's that. Take a look at the Earth at this point. Okay, we've got these these this kind of continent up here with North America, Europe, all kind of together. South America is way down here, dis detached. This was called Gondwana Land. Actually, a cool name. 
Okay, but Gondwana land is when you had all these, uh, this form of the earth like this. Okay, I'll notice a lot of this is down in the pole, polar area. And so most of it was actually frozen over at that, I think, during this point. Um, supercontinent Gondwana land. Okay. Um, North America and Europe were kind of together at this point. We got things like plants and scorpions, millipedes. Okay. The scorpions that they had back then, I don't think the same exact scorpion. I think they have evolved at some point. They were not this big. <laughs> they were still relatively small. There were, like, it, eventually we'll talk about um, insects that were much, much bigger. Uh, but no, the scorpions I do not think were giant. They might have been somewhat bigger, but um, they were definitely on land at this point. Okay. Then we have the Devonian period, okay, another long time ago, 417 million years ago to 354 million years ago. Um, you ended up, Gondwana land completely formed in the southern hemisphere, down, down south. North America, North America uh, Eurasia, part of, in the northern hemisphere. This was the age of fishes, meaning there were lots and lots of fishes back then. Bony fishes, I'm not exactly sure what a lung fish is. I don't know exactly what, what that is. Um, and we had lobe finned fish, another, I don't know exactly what that is. Um, but these guys ended up becoming the amphibians. Okay, so before this period, there were insects on Earth, uh, on, the, on land, but in the water, fish and uh, fish that eventually became amphibians. Um, by the way, all of us have fish as our ancestor at some point. Pretty cool stuff. That monkeys were another of one of our ancestors. Yeah, well, not monkeys per se, but. Um, so other other uh, chimps and things. What's that? Like yeah, yeah. Evolutionary theory shows shows us that we had fish in our background. Okay. All right. Then we had um, the Carboniferous period. Okay. This is where we start getting nice and warm climate here. Okay. You get lots of swamps. Okay. And by the way, this is the period when we got most of the coal and um, the stuff that we use today. So our like, coal that we burn was 300 million years ago was created. And that's how long, that's a long, long time ago. 300 million years, okay? We also had insects. We also had this thing called the am amniote egg, which basically was the type of eggs that we have now for things like amphibians and reptiles and, um, well, not so much amphibians, but reptiles and mammals, okay? And it meant that you didn't have to lay your egg underwater. You could actually lay it on land and everything was self-contained, okay? So like, like what? Turtles, yep. And uh, the, uh, mainly the um, lizards and that reptiles and mammals. And it's a type of egg that has the, the parts of the egg that keep the, um, well, not the babies, the, whatever they are, the Embryo. embryos, yeah. Um, able to live and you can lay the eggs on land. Okay, so really big, big um, uh, development there in the, the way these animals procreated. Okay, so we had more, remember we talked about Pangaea before? Um, this is the part where we start to see the continents that we kind of know and love today. You can see South America there, Africa is not looking quite like Africa yet, but uh, maybe that's the horn, I don't even know, maybe it's a horn up there. Um, and you've got Eurasia, which is Europe and Asia kind of combined, okay? and Antarctica down there as well, and Australia, okay? When these pieces collided, you ended up getting the collision that formed the mountains that we're talking about because these the plates would bounce together or, or collide together and then the land's got to go somewhere and it went up. And that's when you get mountain ranges like the Appalachian Mountains, the Ural Mountains in, I think, Asia, okay? All right, still in the Paleozoic era, the Permian period, 250, 270 million years ago. We got vertebrates, okay? These are the direct, more direct links to reptiles and mammals, okay? The amniotes with those eggs that they form, okay? We had a big extinction happening then. 95% of all marine species gone during this period, okay? Not sure why, I don't know why. Maybe it's people have some ideas why, but I'm not sure. Um, and we lost 70% of the land species, okay? Here's some of the reasons they thought. Uh, land and water redistributed, so maybe it didn't have the right, um, the right qualities that could support those animals. Uh, changed in elevation, so some animal evolves to be at a low elevation, and all of a sudden it's on a mountainous region and it goes up and you know, can't survive. Climate change, 
um, sea levels lowering. If the sea levels lower, <coughs> then there are areas where the sea uh, creatures can't live because there's no more water there, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so uh, big extinction then. We've had lots of extinctions over the history of the Earth. Okay, lots of different extinctions. That was one of them. Okay, Paleozoic uh, experienced several fluctuations in sea levels. When the sea level rises, what happens? Do the shallow seas cover the continents? When the sea level rises, you've got shallow seas that go above the continents. We didn't really talk about it, but that's actually true. More water is tied up in glaciers when the sea level rises. No, it's the other way around, right? Okay, the climate turns warmer when the, and the swamps form when the sea level rises. Um, I don't think it's a direct relationship. That may be the case, but it's not direct. And then the ocean basins become shallow. The basins are the deeper ones, so they don't really become shallow ever. Okay, yeah, it's going to be A in this case. Shallow seas. Okay. Um, you can actually get more glaciers from colder climates, too. So the climate turns warmer and you get more glaciers form. That's um, when the sea level rises. So really, well, the climate could turn warmer. Okay. Okay, let's look at another one. At the end of the Permian period, the sea level actually lowered. The lowering could be a result of what? Glaciation. Uh, nah, maybe. Yeah, I guess if you get glaciers, right, you can lower the sea. The more glaciers that are formed, the less water there is to rise up, so you can get that. Okay. Uh, the collision of Gondwana land. Um, yeah, actually, when you collide two pieces together, you can get less. Uh, you can actually have the ocean. Why would that make the ocean lowering? Uh, yeah, you might. Yeah, you. I'm not sure about that one. Climate change. Um, tectonics and climate change certainly can cause the lowering of the sea. Okay, so yeah, I'd say I'll leave up in this one. Yeah, I'll leave up in this one. Okay, so that was the what was that was the Paleozoic era. Yeah. Now we're going to go into the Mesozoic era. 180 million years ago to 248 million years ago. And by the way, we're just doing it over here. Again, you'll see a lot of this in the video in a few minutes. Three periods, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous period. The Jurassic period, right? Ooh, we know about that. Triassic, dinosaurs and things. Age of reptiles, the Mesozoic era. Okay? Age of reptiles. Most of the land above sea level. You get seas invading North America. You get the breakup of the continents into the continents, okay? Um, Subduction of the ocean crust. So basically, the ocean crust kind of goes, uh, kind of goes underneath, and um, you end up with lots of volcanoes and mountain building, especially along the western coast of, I guess it'd be the western coast of North America. And yeah, you get the mountains forming, like the Rocky Mountains, that sort of thing. Okay, let's see the Mesozoic life. We had that big extinction. When, you, when things go extinct, it leaves more resources for the things that don't go extinct, so they tend to flourish if they can make it. Redwoods, pine trees, flowering plants, insects, okay? Um, the big reptiles, okay? All of a sudden we get dinosaurs and things from during the Mesozoic period, okay? Dinosaurs dominated then. Would have been a pretty cool time to live if you could stay away from the dinosaurs, I guess, okay? One group of dinosaurs ended up birds. They actually, the, the, the theory today is that birds are just dinosaurs with wings, basically. And they also, it's kind of strange, they, the way people sometimes draw dinosaurs now is with wings, or w not with wings, with feathers, rather. Kind of, no scales. Maybe, no scales. Oh, we think that maybe it had feathers, yeah. yeah. Um, we did have lots of extinction at the end of the Mesozoic as well. Uh, and this is where you get that large asteroid or comet, right, where you get the, the idea that um, you could have this one extinguishing event happening. Or maybe there was lots of volcanoes and that tended to uh, create lots and lots of carbon dioxide, blocked out the sun maybe if it turned into uh, smoke and ash and all that. You, know, you never know. Okay. Uh, let's see. The breakup of Pangaea was the greatest tectonic event in the Mesozoic of all the continental unions that survived, which ones are, that existed, which ones survived to, the, to this day. Okay. Our Africa, let's think about this on a map. Africa and Asia, they're kind of connected, but there's a big piece of ocean in the middle, right? Yeah, Indian big. Ocean and kind of the seas and so forth. Yeah, United States and Mexico, are those both uh, continents? No. Asia and India. Well, India is not a continent either, but Asia and India, yeah, they're together, but, but India actually, as it turns out, rose up and smashed into Asia, and that's what caused the 
Himalaya mountains, yeah. So yeah, Europe and Asia, together. They are together. If you go to Turkey, you can go to the edge of where they, they came. Here we go. Asia and India came together, producing Himalayas. So yeah. how were the uh, Alps formed? The Alps were, if I'm not mistaken, were glacial. So a glacier actually, and that was in the chapter we missed, I think. The glacial, uh, the glaciers actually came down and formed those mountains, yeah. cut into it, yeah. Okay. All right, the Cenozoic era. Smaller amount of time, 65 million years. Now, by the way, most of the dinosaurs are gone at 65 million years. Okay? This is where mammals started to flourish. Okay? We had the continents formed in their basic shape that they are now, um, and they're starting to move apart into what we know of now. Two periods, the tertiary and quaternary. Okay? North America, Greenland said, see you later to Europe. Okay? This is where. Well, I guess, the, yeah, the Alps and the Himalayas were where the land masses like, uh, uh, like um, India came up. So I guess the Alps were also created. It does say in here the Alps were created by collisions of land masses. I thought it was glacial. And you had things like the San Andreas Fault because of the plates kind of colliding against each other. Okay? We had a cooling during this period. Okay? Cooling being, instead of being like hot all around the Earth, you got this cooling, you got some of the, uh, you got the ice. In fact, it says here one third of the land was covered by ice. That's a lot of ice at that point. Okay, but we did have mammals, large land animal, large land animals. Okay, many who no dinosaurs are gone by now. Now we've got like large animals like um, yeah elephants. I'm not sure they were elephants, but maybe the elephants' ancestors. Those sorts of giant animals. Woolly mammoths might have been during this period. Yeah, this is when humans started evolving. The Cenozoic era. So remember, we're getting actually we're getting much closer to now, okay. Let's see. Glaciation during the Cenozoic era. Uh, let's see. Is this what? Yeah, it's okay. This okay. So they lied to me before. They lied in that last slide. Carving the Swiss Alps, I do think happened because of glaciation. Lowering the sea as more glaciers form, we get the sea lowering. Okay. Land bridge connect. Land bridge connections. Well, if the sea's lowering, well, that opens up some areas for the land bridges to kind of come across. And by the way, land bridges are where mammals and like humans and so forth, we're able to cross over and populate much of the D. earth. Okay, so yeah, D, all of the above in this case. Okay, all right. Um, which one is the Cenozoic era not noted for? Let's see, did we get humans then? Did we get ice ages? Yeah, did we get swampy conditions that developed fossil fuels? We did or didn't? No, so which of the following is not noted for? Yeah, let's see. It's probably that one. Do we get mountain building because of the glaciers and the, and the things coming together? Yeah, and the San Andreas Fault, actually we did get that during this era as well when the plates collided. So yeah, remember the fossil fuels were much, much previous, like 300 million years ago, not 65 million years ago. Okay? All right, there we go, swampy conditions. Okay, what's that? The San Andreas Fault is in California between like San Diego or Los Angeles and that's why San Diego, that's why California has lots of earthquakes because of the San Andreas Fault. Okay. All right. So, by the way, this is the era Sorry. we live in. Humans are this this era is when we live in. Okay. So that's actually it for the slides. Okay. No more slides for tonight. Um, what we'll do is you want to take another break now and then just slam into the video. Or do you want to just? Go? I tell you, what, the video is broken into pieces. Let's do like the first 15 minutes, then we'll take we'll see. Okay. Yeah, we might as well turn the camera off. I don't think we need it for this one because it's just a video. Um,